when I started these lecture videos, I said to you one of the things that I wanted to do was to provide a different way of thinking about interest groups that wasn't negative. Oftentimes, to the extent that people think about interest groups at all, they think about interest groups in a negative light. And so my part of this lecture was to offer a decidedly more favorable view of interest groups, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, what they provide policymakers, and that is information. That because they're specialists in very specific areas, their, their information, their analyses can help lawmakers and policymakers do a better job of coming up with laws or coming up with rules. I hope I made that argument persuasively. That was my goal. But now I wanna return back to the concern that people have over interest groups and why they have a negative connotation because it's not out of thin air. It's not something that's unfounded at all. There are very legitimate concerns about the influence that interest groups have. But I wanna get, I wanna present a, a more nuanced view of that as well. A lot of concern about interest groups isn't just that interest groups have too much power, but specifically that private interest groups have so many advantages over public interest groups that essentially these private interest groups that tend to be very well funded, that tend to be organized, they basically have a megaphone to get their views out. And the average person has like a little can talk like this and can't do that much, can't have that much of an influence. And so I want to talk about four ways that private interest groups, uh, advantages that for private interest groups have over public interest groups. So first, and I think I said this before in an earlier video, one advantage they have is they have more money. Now it's important to understand why. And I talked about this when I talked about my involvement in the, the labor union. And that is private interest groups get their money through dues and they frequently represent professional people. And so every month, right, if you're a member of the AMA, the American Medical Association or the American Bar Association, you're paying dues. If you're a member of a labor union, you're paying dues every month. And so that means that the interest groups have a consistent flow of money coming in all the time that makes it really easy for them to plan what they're going to do in the future, to strategize how to best get their views across. Public interest groups, on the other hand, have to rely on donations. And donations are not nearly as reliable as dues are because they fluctuate depending on what the economy is like. People have more money or less money to make donations. And generally speaking, the amount that comes out in form of dues is going to be higher than comes out um, by way of donations. And because it's coming from a larger group, it's just a lot more money. So they just have a lot more money. Private interest groups have a lot more money than public interest groups. Also, they have more people. Now, I'm not talking about membership in the private interest groups or membership in public interest groups. When I'm talking about more people, I'm actually talking about more lobbyists. And if you're wondering why the lecture notes don't say more lobbyists, it's because I want to make sure people are paying attention and actually listening to the videos. So anyways, private interest groups, in part because they have so much money, can afford to hire more lobbyists. They have more lobbyists in Washington, D.C. They have more lobbyists in Sacramento and in the other state capitals. They have more lobbyists at the local level. So they can afford to hire more people to help the private interest groups get what they want. Public interest groups, because they don't have that kind of money, can't afford that kind of staff. They can rely on volunteers sometimes, but it's not going to be the same thing when you have a large number of people knocking on doors trying to get in touch with members of Congress or members of the bureaucracy or at the state level. So private interest groups simply can afford to hire more lobbyists to do their bidding than public interest groups. Another thing, because we've talked about the importance of information, public interest groups, private interest groups can provide 
more information to policymakers. They can hire more people to do research. Um, they can print up their research and put it together in like fancy little brochures and hand them out to everybody and make sure that everybody's got a copy, right? They can send it really widely to a large group of people. They can give copies to not just members of Congress, but their staff as well. They can do all of that stuff because they have the money to do it. You know, and their brochures will be all slick and stuff like that. But public interest groups, because they have limited funds, they can't afford to do that. You know, if they have a policy that they've wanted to put together, um, they're not necessarily going to be able to afford a flashy cover and distributing them widely. They have limited resources, and because they have limited resources, they can't hire as many people to do research. They can't distribute it as widely. And then finally, and this is probably one of the most important, is that private interest groups have more connections. Now, this partly comes from um, being able to have more money. But let me give you an example first. If you have a member of Congress, for example, who's been on the Agricultural Committee for, let's say, 20 years, and now they've decided to retire, they know a lot about agriculture. They've worked with the Department of Agriculture over the years. They know all of the people who are involved in policy making, but they've decided to retire. Or maybe they lost an election, right? What a private interest group will do is call up that member of Congress once they've retired and say, we would like to hire you. Now, Perhaps the politician will say, like, man, you know, I've been working for 20 years. I just want to take a break. And they say, well, let, let me tell you how much we'll pay you. And the member of Congress is like, excuse me, because they can afford to pay them way more than they ever made in Congress. They say, oh, yeah, not only that, but we'll give you a fancy office overlooking, you know, beautiful part of Washington, D.C., and that's where you can do your work from. And the member of Congress would say correctly, well, you know, there's a rule that once I retire, I have to wait a year before I can actually lobby members of Congress. And they're like, yeah, we know that. You just come on in. We'll start paying you. You can study up on our industry and what we're doing. Maybe you can give us some tips. And then in a year, you can make your way back to Capitol Hill to talk about, um, talk to various members of Congress. They can afford to do all this stuff. They can afford to pay people who are connected to the policy area that they're interested in because they have that much money. They can afford to do it. And members of Congress will frequently leave Congress and go work for interest groups about which they have a lot of expertise. Now, a public interest group can't afford to do that. They don't have that kind of money. And so in all these different ways, in large part because they have so much money, private interest groups, again, have like a megaphone. They have an in. They're able to get their views out there. And in doing so, they're able to drown out the voices of average people who are represented by public interest groups. And so there's a real legitimate concern that the amount of influence that private interest groups have on the policymaking process is disproportionate to their numbers. They have a lot of money, right? But they don't represent necessarily a huge number of people. Public interest groups do, but they can't get the attention of Congress or the other policymakers in the same way. And this is why people are concerned about the influence that interest groups have. And it's a legitimate concern. My point, though, is that now you hopefully you have a more nuanced understanding of the way interest groups interact in our political system. It's not all just bad. There are some legitimate things to be concerned about, but they also do some good things. And that's really important, too. And then that way you have a more nuanced, more sophisticated understanding of interest groups rather than saying interest groups bad or interest groups good. If somebody asks you, what do you think about interest groups? You can now legitimately say, you know what? It's kind of complicated.
So that's the final video on interest groups. Thank you for listening.